Okay. Thank you. All right, well, let's open up the uh, executive session for the Judiciary Committee. Uh, welcome, everyone. So, gathering. Um, so the order we're going to go in is, uh, I don't know if people have a master sheet or not, but there's um, Senate bills first. We have three of those and then House bills. So Senate Bill 17, relative to evidence of admissions in medical injury actions. Um, you all set? House Bill 145, permitting the audio and video recording of a law enforcement officer while in the course of his or her official duties. And you have a, two or three handouts that have come in recently since the hearing that are at your places, I marked Thank you, Susan. Okay. There were, Mr. Chairman, if I could uh, please speak up on that, there were uh, a few concerns, two concerns that I have, and I have an amendment that addresses those. Uh, first of all, uh, on the, it, it says, uh, wording in the, in the current bill, says any person may make, uh, it allows any person to make an audio or video recording of a law enforcement officer. I would prefer to make that a public official. That's broader, and I think uh, it, I think it's fair to do that, and a public official should not, uh, should be, uh, by, just by the fact that they're a public official, should be in the same situation as a law enforcement officer in this effect. And the second thing is, <clears throat> I think that we should remove the first of the, of the uh, exceptions, and that is the, that the person making the recording shall first give notification of the recording to the officer. I think that uh, weakens the, even the current law. And uh, if, I think what it would do is if, if we have a, a situation where a, a bystander is, is recording an event or uh, activity and picks up in that recording some uh, action by any public official that uh, subsequently ends up in court, if we say that there has to be notification given first, I think what would otherwise be viable evidence would, could be thrown out because we've now said that there has to be notification. And I, I just, I don't think that clause should be in there. Senator, I'm sorry to back up for one second, but you're, up, you're looking at as amended, obviously, by the House, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I just recall some concern raised if it's broader. I mean, I, I remember concern raised by law enforcement officer alone, but taking it a step further to public officials that you talked about, mm -hmm. about what happens if the uh, attorney general is, or an attorney general is having a camera, is working at the desk, they're a public official in the course of their duties, should they be audio or video tape? Uh, it, um, Senator Carson and I talked about that. <laughs> we had a long discussion. We had a, a long this. discussion about just that, and, and the, the question there would be, it, number two, as it's written now, which would be number one under my uh, amendment, the person, it says, provided that the person making the recording is personally interacting with the officer or is recording the officer in a public area. And I would not regard, a, regard the attorney general's desk or office as being a public area. And that's probably a question that, you know, would need to be looked at. But I would, I would regard that as, as not being a public area. Now, if, if there was a person interacting with the Attorney General and that person wanted to record that interaction, then this clearly would say the person could do it. And I wouldn't have a problem with that. But to have a third person do that, you know, I, I, I agree that would be, I would have a problem with that. Do you have copies of the amendment? Yes, sir. Or is it? Uh, I agree. 
just so you know, the Attorney General's office to do the actual electronic pass key to get to where the desk is. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> That's not a good to know. Yeah. We have a copy. Yes, I have a copy. I think it's already being copied. No, I'm not taking your copy. I want our own. <laughs> um, Mr. Chairman, in, as you know, um, Senator Groen said that he and I had a conversation. I think there needs to be a provision in here that states that the audio tape or the videotape is the private property of the individual doing the taping. And that way it wouldn't be subject, from what I understand, to confiscation, or immediate confiscation, that whoever, Rick is rolling his eyes at <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, because I think one of the concerns that we heard during the committee process was that um, someone stopped and, and they're videotaping um, something that's going on with a police officer, and the police officer will just automatically confiscate the tape. If it's designated as private property, they can't do that. Then I would think that they would need a search warrant in order to confiscate that property. Do you need this? I just don't know enough about this, but do you need a search warrant to grab someone's private tape if they're out in public home? I don't know. That's what I. That's why I think we need to do a little bit more research on this before we actually act on this uh, today. The police would say that there was okay. an exigent circumstance, and if they didn't seize it right away, that they, the time it takes to go get a warrant, they would lose. The evidence. They would have to make the case, though. They would have to, right. that the onus would not be on the person doing the videotaping. The onus would be on the police to to go, to, to do that. And I think in, in thinking back to what the justification for the bill was, was that people were out trying to videotape police officers in their, in when they're doing their duty, and <coughs> they're finding that these, these tapes are being are confiscated because they're being accused of what had happened. So um, I, I just want to, I had mentioned to Senator Brown, I had stopped at the Londonderry Police Station and had to stop and get something. And as you walk in the door, there's a big sign on the door that warns you that you are going to be videotaped and audio -taped. And you think about if you're out in a police car, uh, you're not in a police car, but you're stopped by a police, you're being videotaped and audio -taped by that police officer without warning. Um, most people know that that's going on. You see enough cop shows on TV where you have like, the world's dumbest criminals and they're videotaped by the police. But um, I think we just need to be really careful here. I think we need to be very concise about what we want to do and where we want to go with this before we pass it. So I'm recommending for the rest of the committee that we just hold this and we could just continue to work on it. I think Senator Groen has had some really good suggestions. And I think we can work off of his suggestions as we go forward. Uh, well, would it make sense to modify this amendment to include the, the wording that you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Let's see, that's. Yeah. Can, can I just make one suggestion you might want to think about as yeah. a dividing line between the way things happen, and that has to do with the extent to which somebody's holding a video camera in hand, like these fellows over here. We know they're videotaping because we can see the cameras, and that's all well and good, and they're right mm -hmm. to do that. And every, so, you know, if you're having a conversation with somebody and you're holding a camera like this, the person's on notice, even if there's not a specific warning given, right. that a recording's happening. But if you've got one of those little see. ones that goes, you know, into the tie clip or whatever, um, and you're having a conversation with somebody, there's no way they could know that they're being recorded. That may be a different situation. Yeah, to take the yeah. conversation without the knowledge of the other party? Yes, why that instead? Yeah. Yes. So, that's why I said I think we need yeah. a little more discussion on this issue. And like I said, I think Senator Rowan has, has like made, some, right. made some good good points, and I think um, he would be a, a good person to continue to to work on this. So have, have you um, had the opportunity to have a conversation with the Attorney General's office to get the, I mean, you may come to a different conclusion, but to at least get their perspective on this topic? Yeah. Okay. And w well, we have the testimony from them. Mm -hmm. That's a testimony, but, and I can do what I can do. Check back with them on the language as as amended. That would be great. I, I, I just know in some other arenas it's yeah. helpful. Just up front to get that input. Yeah. I assume you're going to jump off. Happy to come and have a conversation with you. Of course. Sure. Um, we're at 146. Relative to the right of the jury to judge the application of the law in relation to the tax contract. 
Constitution, and then it says, and the Seventh Amendment of the Constitution for the United States of America. And there was uh, comment in testimony that the Seventh Amendment of the U.S. Constitution doesn't deal with this jury nullification process. And uh, it doesn't specifically, what the Seventh Amendment uh, speaks to is the right to trial of a jury, and that's why it was included, but uh, I don't see any need for that to be in there, especially since the uh, U.S. Supreme Court has really not extended the U.S. Constitution right to trial by jury to states in their decisions. And so each state develops their own trial by jury uh, rights within the Constitution. So I, that, that I would propose to just delete that phrase and the Seventh Amendment of the Constitution for the United States. The other part that I would recommend is that in, in lines 11, 12, and 13, currently, as, it's, as we have it as amended by the House, it says that the, the right of the accused in all court proceedings, the court shall instruct the jury of its right to judge the application of the law. And my amendment takes that out and leaves, it says, and if you go to line 12 of of my amendment, uh, 2541, it says in all court proceedings, the court shall permit the defendant or the counsel for the defendant to inform the jury. It doesn't require the court to make that in its statement to the jury. Okay. So it's a, it, it, it softens it as far as, you know, previously, as amended by the House, it said, in all court proceedings, the court shall instruct the jury of its right to judge the facts and in the application of the law. And I took that phrase out of there. And I think that with that, uh, and, and incidentally, I just have some other comments. In, in, um, in the New Hampshire Bar Association Criminal Justice uh, publication, New Hampshire Criminal Jury Instructions, 1985, they state that the jury in a criminal case has the undisputed power to acquit, even if the verdict is contrary to the law as given by the judge and contrary to the evidence. This power of jury nullification is a historical prerogative of the jury inherent in the use of the general verdict in criminal cases. But then it goes on to state in the next sentence, however, the existence of the jury nullification power does not mean that a jury must be informed by the judge of that power. And that's what this bill is about. So that there's, there's recognition within New Hampshire law and common law that the right to jury nullification exists. Uh, but 
the current um, view is that it doesn't require the court to either make the statement that to the jury that tells them they have that right or to allow the defense of the counsel to defend the, the, the uh, defendant or the counsel for the defendant to make that case. And I, and I believe that that's what, this, that's what this bill is about, to give the defendant or the counsel to the defendant the right to make that case. Right, and we had some discussion, I thought, at uh, the time that we heard this bill that, oh, well, maybe it was case by case with respect to the judges as to whether or not they allowed it. Just to come back to some of the right. Yeah. Okay. Um, one of the comments, and, and Senator Rowan and I have discussed this also, I think there needs to be some sort of differentiation between the defendant and the counsel for the defendant because if the way that this amendment is worded, it says the defendant or the counsel for the defendant. So you could have someone in court who's represented by counsel. Who's going to be the person getting up to speak? Is it going to be the defendant who's going to get up and, and make their, uh, notify the jury of jury notification, or is it going to be the counsel? If you have someone who's representing himself, then I would think that that would be an appropriate thing for the defendant acting as his own counsel to approach the jury about jury notification. So I, I think there needs to be some more language in there differentiating between these two different types of situations. Because, um, and I, we wanted to ask Mr. Lehman, I don't believe that if someone is represented by counsel in court that the defendant can get up and address the jury. Can they? I think the court would probably allow that. But I don't know for sure. I can't, I can't do that. Okay. I don't know if I'd answer. Okay, that's what I thought. Thank you. They might not. They might say, if you want to speak to the jury, you got to get on the stand and be cross-examined. So. Right. So I think that's yeah, reasonable. I, I think that's reasonable yeah, wording. In the first place, the situation. Mr. Chairman, I, I would, I would just recommend then that it, we could change this simply and see if this would be satisfactory to Senator Carson. In all court proceedings, the court shall permit the defendant, if not represented by counsel, or the counsel for the defendant, and that would that would solve that. If he did, you yeah. might just be able to say the defense. Does that incorporate the okay. okay. Yeah, complicated. that's right. I like that. Because generally the lawyer stands in the shoes of the accused. Like the lawyer is nothing more than the accused. But it's the accused who has all the rights, not the lawyer. Right. Right. Okay. That's that makes it yeah. okay. simple as always better. Okay. Did you have a second amendment? Uh, the other amendment simply took out the Seventh Amendment of the Constitution and didn't change the court. Oh, no, I, there were, so there were two changes, but not two separate amendments that right. were prepared. Well, I, I prepared a second seven. amendment, but the, the first one, which I didn't pass out to you, only removed the phrase the Seventh Amendment to the Constitution. Oh, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's not the one I'm recommending. Right. So, so you prefer the 2541? That's correct. Yeah. Good. Good. I think um, Senator Garland, again, has done some really good work here, and I think we just need to make a few more changes, and we'll be ready for prime time. All right. Moving on. Word. 158, relative to the misuse of social security numbers. 